Hallelujah. Okay. Um, as uh, Jeremy was speaking, first of all, he's talking about drinking. You guys all understand, right? <laughs> Just want to clarify. Um, he's actually talking about drinking of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, you know. We all know Jeremy, but I just want to make sure you guys understand it, amen. So, um, yeah, yeah. He also talked about a runway. I see a bit of a hum up here. So he also talked about a runway and, and running to fly. And, we, you know, we call, we call the airports a runway, but really they should be a flyway. You know, and I like what Jeremy said. He said they should be a flyway because they're actually the way to fly. And uh, as, as he was talking about that, I thought, you know, I travel, uh, last year I was 150,000 miles on aircraft. And that's a lot of miles if you don't know what that looks like. Um, that's a lot, of, a lot of miles. And um, I am thankful that every aircraft I went up on was mechanically fit, and the pilots were capable of flying the plane that was in charge, they were in charge of. And that every runway was long enough for us to take off and long enough for us to land. I say that for a reason, because as Jeremy was talking, I thought, but if you need to run and a plane, we're using a plane as an example, what is it that stops a plane from flying when it's mechanically sick? when it hasn't been mechanically looked after. Its engines are misfiring, there's something wrong, its cabling isn't correct, its computer systems aren't, aren't being taught, the mechanics haven't been able to fix the plane, or, or if we use it as an example in our own Christian life, which I'm trying to use this metaphor for, is the people weren't receiving mechanics instructions. What is it that stops us from flying? It's a hard attitude. But when our heart's not right, we can't fly to the level God has called you into. And immediately I hear a voice of the Lord say, and Brent Borthwick, you're a mechanic. And I said, whoa, never really thought of myself. I mean, yeah, I, I love cars and motorbikes. I have drag raced. I rebuild engines. I have no problem with that. He says, no, you're a mechanic in my church. I still am processing that and I have to pray about that. Because a lot of people, oh no, you're the senior leader, you're the pastor. Yeah, that's right, I'm a mechanic. Well, I don't know, mechanics a little low on the totem pole. It's not when you need your car fixed. It's not when you get into an airplane and you hope the mechanic fix that plane well. I'll tell you what, that mechanic has become a very important ability to have that plane fly. And so I want to encourage you as I teach here in this house to a family and to people watching around the world, I'm a mechanic. I'm not here to fluff. Imagine a mechanic coming, you know, you take your car in and it's not running well. And the mechanic says, ah, oh, don't worry, just, just keep driving it. Yeah, but it keeps stalling out. It's not, don't worry. Yeah, but the brakes don't work. Don't worry. Just, it's all in the grace. <laughs> yeah, but, but seriously, it's, my car is dangerous. Don't worry. Be happy. And so I'm going to process a little bit on what the Lord's trying to tell me about being a mechanic. And I pray that this family and this leadership will be good mechanics that will be able to help you diagnose things in life that are going to radically change your life by preaching the word of God, that are going to change things in your life, in your car, in your airplane, so you can run fast enough down the flyway to take off and fly. And I... I believe that as a mechanic watches that airplane take off and fly, he might be back in the hangar, but he's probably celebrating that he fixed that plane. He was able to be able to input enough data into it that that plane could do what it was called and destined to do. I want you to know that's my heart here. 
When I'm teaching you, I'm preaching the word of God, our leaders, our pastors, we're preaching the word of God, our heart is not to condemn, but to bring ideas on how to fix the things in life. And let me tell you how that happens right here. Because my ideas and your ideas of this, no matter what you hear on the internet, the word of God is steadfast. It is truth and it will set you free. And you can, you can try to twist this word. Every false religion out there has twisted some form of the Bible. True Christianity is a Christ follower of Jesus Christ. That means this is your most favorite book, and this is the mechanics lesson right here. And so that's my heart and desire as we minister, that we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we come on a Sunday morning, yeah, we're happy, we're joyful, whatever it is. That's our heart and our passion. But our heart and passion is that somehow every one of us, even the preacher, is going to get a mechanics lesson lesson to help my car run better, to help my heart, the motor of who I am, be all that it can be, not just 50 horsepower. That's pathetic. 600 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower, 2,000 horsepower. Some of you are like, what's a horsepower? Well, it, it goes back to the terminology of what one horse can pull. Oh, yeah, well, some people love just one horse. I don't. I like 600 plus horsepower. That's how I like it. Fast, fast, fast. Up to the speed limit, of course. It doesn't say how fast I can get to the speed limit, but we've been talking. To, oh, so let's see, make sure I clarified that. Amen. Okay, we started last Sunday in Joshua 1, verses 5 to 9. I'm going to read them real quick again, and I want to carry on. I didn't, I didn't get everything out that I, I really felt to share. Uh, Joshua 1, verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you. So we got to remember what's happening here before I read this, okay? So Joshua has been raised up spiritually by Moses. Moses has now passed away. He's died, so Joshua has become the leader. And we know that, that that original generation that was rescued out of Egypt from slavery had so much slavery left in them that they grumbled, they complained, they, they, they went into false idol worship, they went into all these things, uh, and it took them out of the promised land. They were not able to cross in the promised land. And even, even uh, Moses had previously cried out to God, please let me see the promised land. And God said, no, no, because your people screwed it up for you. And I'm just, that's Brent Borthwick interpretation, okay? So anyways, which is interesting principle if we really think about it. So let's take a look. So here, here Joshua is receiving a word from the Lord, okay? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. How many would like that? No one can stand before you. What that means is no one can defeat you all the days of your life. So, so Joshua is receiving promises from God personally. And I want to go through how Joshua got into the place to receive the promises of this victory before anything had happened. We actually have promises of victory before a war ever starts in our life. We already have promises of victory before a sickness comes, before a bad attitude comes against us. We already have the promises of victory in advance. Amen? Amen. So no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. This is an important part. It's now repeated three times back to back. That means listen, this is what's going to happen. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or hand or to the left wherever you go. Uh, sorry, or left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So in other words, this is my command. Do not turn left or right from this. And wherever you go will prosper. You want prosperity? Follow the word of God. 
You want victory in your life? Follow the word of God. Live a lifestyle that is according to what God has called us to do. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Not just on it, but get into it. Meditate in it day and night. That means you will live in this word day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, I pray, Lord God, that we can grab those verses and bring them into our own life today. I pray, Father, that we will have a rich encounter of what your word does as we meditate in your word, in your word, in your word, and we meditate in that. Father, in the new covenant, Lord God, we have a great understanding and a revelation, Father, of a lifestyle that you've called us to live. And it's in your word, Father, I pray that something radically will shift in our hearts, in our leadership, in leaders around this world, in churches and families around this world, that we will go after the purity of your word. And we will raise up sons and daughters that don't live on the edges of sin or in sin, but live in the fullness of your light. In Jesus' name. These are keys to victory, Joshua 1, 5 to 9. God repeated this exhortation three times uh, to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. We need great courage and strength to live, Joshua 1, 7, to do according to all the law which Moses commanded and not turn from it. It's so important in this day and hour that we don't turn from the Bible. We don't turn from the Word. There's so much mixed up warped theology out there uh, that everybody seems to think they're a theologian. And if the Bible doesn't line up with their own selfish or sometimes deceitful desires, they switch it out. And you can't do that, people. The Bible doesn't depend on you. You depend on the Word. That's the way it is. And I'm getting tired of of ministers of the gospel that you think are doing great and mighty works uh, that behind the scenes are living in deception. They're living in sin and issues and problems. We have got to have a generation that's going after the purity of God in their life that are called to go out into the world and preach the gospel with pure hearts, uh, with pure lives, uh, and pure desires in them. Good, I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Whew. Got a little worked up there. The, the truth that God gave to Joshua is the same truth that God gives to you and me today. <laughs> Be strong and courageous. Do we get this point? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Don't wander away from the way. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This verse is simple but yet very profound. I love a quote that Papa Bill Johnson says. He says, Our strength and courage to do what God has told us to do flows directly from our awareness that God is with us. Let me say it again. Our strength and courage, if you feel weak and in fear, I will guarantee you you've lost the awareness of God in your life. Let's see, so this quote again, our strength and courage to do what God has told us to do flows directly from our awareness that God is with us. I tell you what, when I get into some of these, these lands, some of these Islamic territories, nations, or countries, some of these other areas in Mexico, they're violent and difficult in South and Central America, I tell you what, I stay very focused. I stay very focused on my awareness of who God is. I get out of that plane, I get out of a car, I I remember seeing four guys come up that came there to shoot me in Guatemala. And Sharon and I knew it, we had been warned that there was a gang coming to take me out, but we still went to the ministry and it was one of those churches that had no back wall, like it just went to the street. They had these metal doors that would go up and down like a business down in, in Guatemala. 
And so all the doors are up, and I'm feeling this oppression during worship. And I turn around, and I see that there's someone that looking in. And then I said to Sharon, I said, you know, hey, we got to pray. Because the pastors thought I was nuts to go there. Because the threat was real. I had a hit on my life. And I'm getting up there preaching, and I'm watching four of them stand right smack dab at the back of the, bill, at back of the church, staring at me, pistol like this. And I, start, I tell you what, I, I forced myself to have an awareness of God. <laughs> an awareness of God. I was, I was, while I'm preaching, I'm preaching the testimonies of God. I'm preaching the testimony of the saints that had gone before me. I'm preaching the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And I'm speaking and preaching and I'm looking at these four guys. And the leader, I can remember it clearly as I'm staring back there. And the leader, after about 15 minutes of watching me and staring at me, he put his hand out to the guys with the guns. And he said, no. And they turned and they walked away. I felt like I was ready to pass out. I'll be honest, I started shaking. They thought it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that I'd been drinking in the Spirit. This truth reveals how critical our awareness of God's presence has to be in our life. You have to, I have to be aware of God's presence all the time in our life. <laughs> An important part of this process is the assignment to meditate in God's word. That we have to meditate in his word. <laughs> There's many people that get kind of scared in life sometimes and, and they'll start to pray the Lord's prayer. That's a good prayer to pray. Do something to meditate in his word. In Joshua's case, the book of the law included Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which are the books of Moses. These books included both the commands of the Lord and the history of the Lord's supernatural relationship with Israel. So he, he heard the history, but he heard the history and the testimony of the supernatural relationship that God had with Israel. And we're to meditate in the scripture of God's commands because this carries huge testimonies of the saints of the day. We need to meditate in what God has done in the word of God, the miraculous, the signs, the wonders, the way he provided, the provision, the promised lands, how enemies were defeated by a praise group. How the fiercest armies known to man, three of them gathered together, and the Levites went out singing and praising victory before the war even began, and it drove the enemy absolutely nuts. I guarantee you, in the time of battle, praise God. Amen. Praise him. Start singing praises to him. It works. It works. It's worked in my own life so many times. And it's the time most people don't want to praise because they want to wallow or they're so concerned with the issues and problems, you stay in the defeated position of the problem. But God is saying, that's not your destiny. You're not destined, destined to stay in the defeated position of a problem. You're destined to be the victory of the problem. In Joshua 1 verse 5 to 9, God commanded this. God doesn't give him a whole lot of explanation on how and why this meditating on the law worked. He didn't go into a long dialogue of how to do it. He just said, do it. The scripture says that we actually make our own way successful and prosperous by doing it. <laughs> if you're not feeling successful and prosperous... Get in the Word, and don't just read it. Meditate in it. Don't just read it with your mouth. That's a good thing to do, but focus in it, study in it, and become the living Word of God on this earth. And I will guarantee you, you will see fruitfulness, successfulness, and prosperity come into your life. Many of, many of us have seen that the prophetic power of testimony is only one dimension of how testimony makes us prosper in our calling. 
Another quote from Bill Johnson. Our meditating in the testimonies of the Lord is the primary thing God has given us to sustain our awareness of his presence with us. What's one of the greatest ways to sustain the awareness of God in our lives? Meditate on his testimonies. If you got cancer, think of Sid. You have an issue or problem, think of what God's already healed you of before. Celebrate the miraculous of what God's doing with people around you. Hear the testimony of the word and of the word being released and set free in bodies and humans around this world. Think of the testimony of a few months ago when this woman, this Muslim woman with this massive tumor on her neck couldn't look me in the eye. Not allowed to, full, full, covered up, full borka. But you know what? She didn't have to look me in the eye. She just had to look Jesus in the eye. And God used my hand that felt like it was on fire, ready to burn her neck off. He just used my hand to put on her neck. To get, see her get 100% healed. And the very next day, over 50 of her family, including her husband and all the men, came and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and uncovered in front of us. And now one of the newest church plants in Pakistan is that group of people. I tell you what, we got to get our eyes off man and get our eyes back on God. When we remember who God is and what he has done, the prophetic anointing on that testimony creates the awareness that God is with us now and ready to do it again. He doesn't do it one time. He does it over and over and over and over. His miraculous power is not a one-time Dairy Queen visit. His miraculous power is a buffet I'm hungry right now. That's why I'm talking about food. It's, it, it, it's, it's like a never-ending buffet of every single thing that needs miraculous power. This awareness, it's, it becomes our source of strength and courage. The command to meditate in the testimonies of the Lord also clarifies how God defines our success in fulfilling our commission as his people. We, th- we meditate in these testimonies of the word of God. Because our success is really about radical obedience. <laughs> our success is about radical obedience. Hmm. Can we, uh, the pro presenter person, can we put that offering slides up again? It's the same one I read, we read a few weeks ago. And I don't know if I shared this testimony to you or not. But two weeks ago, remember, I went back in my message and we reread the offering declaration. We reread it right after service ends. I get a testimony of somebody we know very, some people we know very, very well that ended up doing renovations in their home and they found bags in their wall. They pulled and opened up the bags in their wall. And it's full of gold coins. So I just need to say, hey, where are you in your believing when we read these declarations? Let's read the declaration again because you know what? I just think we need to go after stuff. We are receiving today's offering. We're believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses. Benefits, sales, and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises. Fine. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just want to camp out on finding money for a moment. Because when you find money, debts get paid off. It's a beautiful thing. They, Some of the coins are from the 1800s. No, like these are close friends of mine. 
that are, are preciously going after God have abandoned their jobs and served the Lord year after year after year, literally doing a reno in the new home that they just bought, getting it ready, not knowing how their ministry is going to keep going financially. And opens up a wall that they're renovating and finds bags in there. And it's not dope. It's gold coins. People, people, do we believe? Literally, half an hour after the service ended two weeks ago, I get the news. (laughs) Finding money. I want to renovate every wall in my house right now, but... But my father-in-law built the house, so, yeah. Okay. Finding money. Debts paid off. Expenses decreased. How do expenses decrease? No. If you find money, your expenses could increase. How do expenses decrease? Being wise. Because you know what? If you ever watch those lotto shows... Most of the people that won millions that were flat broke within three to four years are in worse shape than they were because they didn't decrease their expenses. They radically increased it. Blessings and increase. Who wants that? Look at it. Even I see gold coins in that picture right now. I've never seen that before. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Our success is not about doing supernatural things. Our success is doing what God has asked us to do. Listen, please. We look at a lot of ministers and we see supernatural things happening. And we're like, oh, oh. Like rock stars. Ah. Our success is not about doing the supernatural. Our success is doing what God has asked us to do. And when we do what God has asked us to do, supernatural things just happen anyways. Our success is really about our relational response to God. Oh, you can go out and do everything you can with your own ability, and you might become and build a good business, but you might not ever see the prosperity of God's business in your life. Our success is really about our relational response to God. The source of all our blessing and prosperity and goodness is always connected to, the, to our relationship and connection with God. It's everything in our life. Even in marriage, if you have a good heart relationship with your spouse, you're probably going to have a successful marriage. If you don't have a good heart relationship with your spouse, you probably are going to have a bad relationship. If you don't have a good heart connection with your children, you probably aren't going to have a close relationship. You have a good heart connection with your children. You probably will have successful relationship with your children. It's the same principle with, with our relationship with God. If we don't have a good heart connection with him, chances are our relationship isn't going to be that great. We make our own way prosperous through obedience to God. When we do what God asks us to do, we strengthen our connection with the source of life. That's him. The more we live our lives in agreement with God, the more his nature and his kingdom manifests in all of us. Because radical obedience is a matter of relationship, it is always a hard issue. Listen. Because radical obedience is a matter of relationship, it it is always a hard issue. If you're not obedient, it's not God's heart, it's your heart issue. If you're feeling you don't have a close relationship with God, it's not God's heart issue, it's your heart issue. Because radical obedience is such an importance. I just love it when we have such a relationship and intimacy and trust with God 
that he says jump and we just say how high. <laughs> Go, we say when. Now, okay. Instead, sometimes he says, go. Uh, not yet, God. Go. Not there. Go. Uh, kind of happy where I'm at. Keeping the testimony of Jesus Christ is the key to radical obedience. This radical obedience is designed to do something in our hearts first. In Deuteronomy 3, 25 to 26, we won't turn there, uh, Moses cried out to God to please let him see the promised land. Oh, they've been 40, 40 years in the desert, and Moses cries out to God, oh, please. It's like right across the river. Please let me just see the promised land. But the Lord was angry with Moses because of the people. And God said, enough of that. Speak no more to me in this matter. That's pretty strong words. You know what? We're here as a family to be successful and prosperous in the kingdom of God. When you do good, we all do good. When you live blessed, we all live blessed. When you have the wisdom of the Lord in your life and you're making wise decisions, we all get blessed from that. I don't want to say it, but here the people knocked Moses out of the promised land. Because in one way, Moses wasn't able to stop the people from doing their own will. And so, as I process this, I want to encourage you. If your choice is not to grow more in God, if your desire is to live in sin, if your desire is not to be a Christian, let me give you a, a real good answer right now. Find Jesus Christ in your life. And if you choose to try to be in ministry while you're living a sinful life behind the scenes. And I want you to say, you actually aren't going to be super welcome in this house. We're not going to break our moral standards so someone can live in sin freely and become an example to people around them. Are you kidding me? We love you, but we hate sin. And I want to see a company, a, a, a company of people, an army of people, a tribe of people that are literally raising up in their own hearts, mamas and papas that are so after the wind of the Holy Spirit and the word of God in their life that they become a living testimony so our young ones don't have to go down the dark, dirty roads. But they can build off of a foundation that we've already been establishing from God's. And our ministers, our evangelists, our prophets can live in the freedom of purity instead of the bondage of sin. And right now, there's things going on. You probably hear things on the internet. And there's some things I'm very, very aware of. Been talking to some big name people about it. And I want you to know this man. I stand for purity and righteousness. I love the people, but I hate sin. And my heart is about restoration. If the people are willing to ask for forgiveness, and that means you have to admit what went wrong. It doesn't have to be publicly, but it has to be to people that have authority in your life. And my encouragement to us now is just don't believe everything you hear. But at the same time, don't condemn when you don't know not, uh, much about something. And matter of fact, even if you know a lot about it, don't condemn. So here we are in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Moses had cried out to God already to let him see the promised, promised land, and 
God said, no. I don't want to ever get to that place. And you're going to say, oh, no, no, no. Well, that's old covenant versus new covenant. Oh, no. Moses had a covenant with God. (laughs) It was a relationship. Of course, Jesus Christ wasn't here. The new covenant wasn't established. But Moses had a relationship. God's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And I truly believe that he's looking for a peoples that are going after purity and righteousness and justice. So in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, Moses told the people, now he went, he told the people who had crossed the Jordan into the promised land, he said, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself Lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Sharon and I have practiced in our in our marriage and in our family that we speak more to our kids about the good things that God has done and is doing than the problems that are happening around us. We have chosen our whole marriage to not dwell on the problems and the issues. Even if one of our kids does something, did something wrong, we don't dwell on that fact. And once it's been forgiven, memory no more. Later Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, Find out, find out of its spring the issues of, for out of its spring the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart pure. Keep your heart clean. For out of this heart springs the issues of life. Whatever fills our hearts will fill our thinking and our behavior. We stay focused on all the problems and issues. I guarantee you, your behavior will have problems and issues in it. We focus on uh, the testimony of God, and that becomes our main focus of everyday lifestyle. I guarantee you, you will have testimonies of God in your life. When we keep the testimony of truth, we we fill all our hearts with truth. The truth of one of who God is becomes the truth of who we are and the truth of where we've come from. This testimony leads us to the truth of where we're going in God. How many of you believe we're on a pathway on a runway on a on a flyway with God so this two testimony it leads to the truth of where we're going in God it is our responsibility to fill our hearts with the truth and not the lies of the enemy I tell you there are so many people that that fill their hearts with the lies of the enemy what's 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 a common lie that people fill their hearts with Satan's powerful For who? Who is he powerful? He he lost. He's a loser. Well, no, he's so powerful in my life. What? No. Jesus has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. But if we open the door, yeah, Satan. Satan can have power. Shut the door to the devil to the enemy, to sin. Throughout the book of Deuteronomy, Moses emphasized to Israel that from God's perspective, the real threat to their success in the promised land did not exist among the enemy tribes or giants in the land. Moses said clearly that the real threat the perspective that he, as he was teaching, the real threat was not the enemies. It wasn't the enemies in the promised land. It wasn't the tribes of giants in the land. The actual main threat was the internal reality of your heart. And that's where the battle rages from the enemy is trying to separate your heart from God. In Psalms 95 verse 10, God says about the Israelites, 
For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. The word translated go astray in this verse means err and wander. Error, like error in your life, and wander. So what God was saying, for 40 years I was grieved with that generation. It is a people who erred and wandered in their hearts. Israel's wandering in the wilderness was really the outward manifestation of what was already in their hearts. Their hearts were wandering. The outward manifestation was they wandered in the desert for 40 years. In other words, our internal reality becomes our external reality. Are you guys awake? Our internal reality will become our external reality. And as this verse explains, what was in their hearts was related to the fact that they erred in the ways of God. They erred in the ways of the Word. Because their hearts were not in God, they erred in the ways of God. Because they erred in the ways of God, they wandered in the wilderness. Scripture points out that knowing God's ways is more important than knowing God's acts. Psalms chapter 103, verse 7, it says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. He made known his ways to Moses, but all the children of Israel saw were his acts, the things he did. Moses knew the ways of God. So if I apply this scripture with a little of my own interpretation in it for today, it could also mean that it's more important to know a minister's ways than to know their acts. It's more important that we know God's ways more than his power of his acts. It's more important that, a, that we know ministers that know the ways of God way more important than their acts, what they do supernaturally. So many people flock to the acts, to a good speaker, to, 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 to someone who's doing signs and wonders. But I think what we should start looking at more is how are the ways of the minister? Let's just take a look at his family for a moment. Let's take a look at his history. Let's take a look at some of the things of who he is, who she is. Not just what they do. What people do is geared around a five-fold ministry gift, but true anointing comes from the intimacy of God in their life. It's not a healing means a person's anointing. That means God's anointed. People, I'm not saying ministers that have had issues and problems can't be forgiven and restored. But I am saying if there's a continuation of the problems, It's all covered under the blood. I know. I used to live the greasy, greasy slope. I was brought up in it. And what I got out of it was I could do whatever I wanted on a weekend as I played guitar in the rock bands, doing the bars and the clubs. And Monday, night, Monday morning, or if I could remember Sunday night, I just asked God to forgive me and I was good to go again. <laughs> and then I realized, hold it, this whole Christian relationship is actually about 
not what I do, but about who I am with him. It's not about my gift or lack of. It's about my me knowing his way. Don't be a casual Christian. Don't just run after the next big evangelist because you've seen a bunch of things happening. Run after the one who created you and me. Run after the one who has the answers. No man, only God. Don't come to this church because of me. Many have left because of me, but <laughs> come here in this family because of God. That his word will be preached, whether it makes you happy or offends you. His word will still be preached. His word has offended me many times. you what I thought I had my own way and I knew my own way the older I get the more I realize how little I used to know and how much more I just need more of him no one's perfect this whole ministry is about forgiveness and restoration but our heart is to restore people into greater things, not back into a sinful nature. Our heart is to bring everybody that takes the past and the sinful nature, gets rid of it, but remembers the power of the testimony of Jesus Christ and how he transformed you and how he transformed me. Let's celebrate that testimony. A heart to know God is willing to pursue the God behind the acts and the testimony. Without the understanding of God's ways revealed in testimony, we will not consistently walk in radical obedience. And without the awareness of God's presence with us, we also will not consistently walk in radical obedience. How many here would love to walk in radical obedience? Let's all stand. I'm not a judgment prophet. I truly believe that we are to be the encouragers and the exhorters of the victory that God has for every one of us already. I'm not going to be one that hangs and camps out on doom and gloom, so if you come to me with doom and gloom, chances are I pretty much won't want to talk much about it. I used to. I used to love to talk about all the doom and gloom around the world. I remember years and years ago. That's why the hurricane hit, you know, and wiped out Jamaica. Something like that. Oh, my goodness. I look at it and say, if a natural disaster happened, it's an open door for us to go and be who we're called to be. And go reach out to those people help them and bless them through the disaster. I just feel in my heart, people, that there has to be a transformation in our mindsets. God is a good, good God. His way endures forever. His light is the life that you and I need to have. I have watched the power of the word and the moving of the Holy Spirit 
take extreme drug addicts on the highest of cracks, crack and heroin, and literally completely get delivered instantaneously in a meeting. <laughs> no withdrawals and never going back. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ. I have watched marriages that have been on the rocks, literally. Prayer. People radically getting an encounter of God and the Holy Spirit in them. Bam! Love again. But you know what it took? It took the loss and the losing of pride. And the losing of selfishness. And the losing of unbelief. And it took the receiving to know that God has given us power and authority to walk in everything he has called us into. Some of you here today, maybe some that are watching right now, maybe you've been feeling really dead or dry or not super hungry. Well, let me tell you what. in you is hungry. The spirit in you is hungry. And if that spirit's not get being fed, then change whatever it is that's stopping the spirit in you from being fed the word of God. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? As your Lord and Savior, guess what? Today's the day. Today's the day. You get to make that choice have you raise your hands we could pray a prayer together or you could just say you know what that's me I'm receiving you Jesus in my life right now I believe in you thank you I feel like some of you have been longing for ministry and you feel like the, the dream is on the verge of either dying or becoming frustrated Don't dream about ministry. Dream about God. Dream about God. Know his ways. Not just see his acts. Know his ways. Because I guarantee you, you're called. And you're called into ministry. Every one of you in this place. What do you mean? We're all going to be preachers? No, 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 no. Ministry which is ministering the gospel of the kingdom to everyone you touch, everyone you see, even right down to the servers and the waitresses that serve you today or tomorrow. And so I ask today as we close, your peace that passes all understanding, that by your stripes we're healed. That we hunger to know your ways, God and become your ways on this earth. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, this amazing family that's here, this amazing group of Windward, I pray blessing upon each one, Father, that we will receive, <laughs> repair from your word. We receive it, Father. And we change the things that are holding us back. That our hearts cry out to you, oh God, oh God. We hunger for more. And I thank you, Father, for all the ministers of the gospel, the churches, the local churches around the world, Father, the ones that are even connected with Windward, Father. I just lift them up and bless them. Colombia, Father, Mexico, uh, Korea, Russia, Pakistan, Father. We just pray blessing. Canada, America, the churches, Father, we pray blessing upon them, Father. We pray blessing upon all the ministers, even ones that have been backsliding or living in sin. We pray, Father, that the true uh, 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 re a resolution within their own hearts will realize and will come back to a saving salvation grace through Jesus Christ, your Son. And I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord God, that we live in a beautiful country called Canada. And I pray blessing upon this nation as the presidential elections are coming up in October. I pray wisdom upon the next prime minister, Father. I pray, Lord God. 
I pray, Father, we thank you for it. I thank you for each family that's represented in this house, each son, each daughter, each mother, each father, each grandma, each grandpa. I pray, Lord God, the richness and the fullness of your blessings to be bestowed upon everyone in this house and the ones around us, I pray, Father, that we become the walkers of blessing and the deliverers of hope, the joyful expectation of good. In Jesus' name, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And all the people said, Amen, Amen.